Hello, hello, and good evening, community. It's so great to see you all tonight. Pardon our lateness with technical difficulties as we navigate the world of Zoom. I just wanted to come on and give a warm, warm welcome to tonight's uh, of this, this event. Uh, my name is Catherine Mbali Green Johnson. I am the director of programming here at the Laundromat Project. I use she, her pronouns. I'm using, a, I'm sorry, I am wearing a black top with cut out shoulders, uh, gold hoop earrings, red lipstick, and African print head wrap uh, with a repetitive motif of masks. Um, I'm in my home located in New Jersey on the unceded lands of the Lenape people. And we are so excited to be here with you all this evening. Just to note, um, for any of you that need ASL access and interpretation, please access it in your in the toolbar on your Zoom screen, so that can we can all be um, on the same page and one accord this evening. Again, just a warm welcome. I wanted to start off by saying congratulations to uh, the program team for pulling this together, Trisha, Issa, Chantel, and Alex for your hard work. For all of the fellows that are part of this culminating uh, ceremony, thank you so much for your hard work and uh, dedication to this process. Throughout this journey, we use the power of the four elements uh, to bring about the change that you're going to witness tonight. Uh, this, this incredible and powerful cohort of fellows started off powerfully at our orientation by using the element of water. We poured libation and we offered and welcomed in the ancestors um, from our own lines and our community lines to usher us through this process, we then use the power of air, our very own air to move us through all of the workshops that we 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 were um, blessed to, to take part in. We then use the power of the earth to ground us, uh, to, to creatively move through conflict and to stay grounded and um, keep the course. And then tonight you'll see the fire. The, ign the igniting of all of the thoughts and creativity that they brought to community with their partners and the power that they are going to bring. So I'm going to remind you tonight as you listen to the stories and you hear all of the um, how things came to be, I want you to use those four elements for your own selves to take some of this medicine that you'll hear and apply it to your own lives, and apply it to your communities, so we can usher change in all the communities and neighborhoods that we live in across the world, across this great nation, and as most importantly, within our hearts and minds and within our own families and lines. So I just wanna say a few things before I pass on to the next presenter. This um, this culminating event of our Artist Fellowship Program, uh, we are going to gather in joy and the power of art. I want you to, again, listen to this incredible work and the power that they have produced. And now with the with the no longer um, without further ado, I'll pass it to our next presenter. Thank you, Catherine. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Trisha Barton. I'm the Senior Manager of Arts Pedagogy with the Laundry Mat Project. I am currently wearing a knitted uh, beige uh, sweater tank, and I have braids and uh, golden um, hoop earrings. 
I'm here just to acknowledge, to do our general uh, land acknowledgement, where we say that we respectfully acknowledge and honor um, that we are on traditional lands of the Lenape and the Canarsi, who have stewarded this land for generations. We pay our respects to elders, past, present, and future. And as it relates to the past, present, and future, we ask um, to go ahead and place into the chat um, any ancestors or any people of the past, the present, and the future that you would also like to welcome into this space um, that Catherine just uh, wonderfully shared as it relates to all of the elements um, as we take this time to celebrate our fellows. I can start. Um, so someone that I would name um, is Almeda E. Trish, my grandmother. And looking at the chat to see anyone else that's sharing um, ancestors of the past, present, and the future. Michelle Gamble, Shamini Gamble Gibson, Lori Carlos, the Haya uh, Reddy, please excuse me if my pronunciation is incorrect, Theo Rios, Li Ming Jun, Vanessa Carter, Socorro Zunija, and I'll do one more. Uh, Robbie McCauley. Please continue to add to this uh, chat, um, even though I won't be saying those uh, names. Aubrey T Tudor, William Green, Jared Glenn, Patty Carthen, Omido Vivrios. Um, I'm now going to please add, continue to add to the chat to create this space for our ancestors of the past, present, and the future. And I'm now gonna pass it on um, to our executive director, Aisha Williams. Thank you. Thank you, Trisha. And good evening, everybody. Thank you for gathering in community with us. My name is Aisha Williams and I am the executive director here at the Laundromat Project. I am joining you from Bedside, Brooklyn. The, un, the occupied and unceded lands of the original stewards, the Munsi Lenape, um, also the neighborhood of, of historic cultural institutions such as the East and home of the celebrated of celebrated activists and cultural leaders such as environmentalist and community advocate, Ms. Hattie Carthen, whom you will hear more about later in this program. I am most importantly here to congratulate and celebrate the 2023 Create Change Fellows, but also wanna take a moment to acknowledge the LP team, Trisha, Chantel, Issa, Alex, Catherine, for all of your work in stewarding, supporting, and mentoring the fellows over the past six months. I also wanna thank our guest workshop facilitators for lending their wealth and knowledge and expertise to this group of artist leaders and our Funders and Catalyst Circle members for making programs like the Create Change Fellowship possible. Uh, the Create Change Fellowship, for many who don't know, came to be in 2011, six years after the founding of the Laundromat Project. The program was developed based on feedback from our residency artists who expressed a need for more support in learning how to develop ethical and community responsive public art projects in community, particularly in communities of color. These were artists who chose to dedicate their creative practice to engaging with community and advancing social justice. The program has evolved and adapted to the times and needs of our communities and practitioners, but we always return to the fundamentals of how we understand what is needed to do this work. Like how do you actively engage in community and cultural organizing or what does it look like to practice entering building and exiting community? The celebrated activist Angela Davis once expressed in her mandate for a people's culture that ultimately art can propel people towards social emancipation. She expressed a hope that existing artists will draw inspiration from the creative energy of the process and new artists would emerge as a result, setting a dynamic in motion that would move us securely in the direction of full emancipation and a peaceful future. Here at the LP, we call that liberation. Over the 12 years of the fellowship, we have, rough, we have had roughly 130 artists come through the program. 
They have gone on to found collectives to fight tenants' rights, build archives of neighborhood and people's histories, lead COVID relief efforts, establish entities for supporting health and wellness, and even become board members of the organization. Our artists alum are change agents and uh, draw inspiration from their collective creative energies. And to you, the 2023 Create Change cohort, you are now fully a part of this community and we are all the better for it. I look forward to the added energy that each of you will contribute to this dynamic ecosystem as we collectively advocate for systematic changes that support community prosperity and reinforce social bonds. We can't wait to continue nurturing your practice as it evolves over time. Thank you for inspiring us all through your bold and intimate visions of a more just future where we can all foster all the components which make us complete. I love that this celebration is taking place on the solstice, the longest day of the year. That leaves more time for us to celebrate each of you. So thank you. And now with that, I will turn it to our host, curator and writer, Allison Glenn, who will graciously guide us through the evening's program. But first, very quickly, a little bit about Allison, whose practice focuses on the intersection of art and publics through public art, biennials, special projects, and major commissions by a wide range of community of contemporary artists, excuse me. She is co-curator of Counterpublic Triennial 2023 in St. Louis, and her writing has been featured in catalogs and publications such as the Princeton Architectural Press, Crystal Bridges Museum of Art, Studio Museum in Harlem, and she's also contributed to Art Forum, Hyperallergic Art 21, and many, many more. So Allison, welcome. Thank you. And Create Change Fellows, congratulations. I cannot wait to see what you have for us tonight. Thank you so much, Aisha. And thank you so much to the Laundromat Project team. There are so many people that have made tonight happen. And on to what we're here for. I am so honored to be hosting tonight's presentations with the Create Change Fellows. And the first group is Community Well. I'll be introducing Fio LaFair, Kiara Armani Judy, Leslie Mahia, and the community partner, Khadija Tudor from Life Wellness Center. I have curly hair with bangs and I'm wearing a striped dress. Hello everyone and welcome. Um, my name is Fiola. Um, we introduce ourselves in just a bit, but um, this is our recap of our wellness kickback um, with Life Wellness Center, um, also with Khadija, who's joining us here tonight. So just taking some time to introduce ourselves. Yeah, hi, I am Kiara Armini, pronouns are they, them. Good evening, everyone. My name is Leslie Les Mejia. My pronouns are she, they. I'm wearing a blue top with no sleeves. Uh, hey, y'all. My name is Fayola Fair. Um, I use she, they pronouns. Um, I am. I have pink hair, and I'm wearing a black dress with a collar. Cool. That's us. All right, so about our wellness kickback. The Community Well Wellness Kickback occurred on June 16th from 4.30, 6.30 p.m. at the Life Wellness Center on Tompkins Avenue. Life Wellness Center is a Black-owned community space offering massage, acupuncture, and other wellness services to bed -Stuy. Our activation held space for community members to learn various wellness strategies connected to mind, body, and spirit. These strategies included conscious art making, poetry writing, and self-massage. The activation addressed the topic of community health and wellness by equipping attendees with the knowledge and materials to engage in practices to attend to their own wellness individually or in a communal setting. Our goal was to provide ways to think about wellness outside of consumption and capitalism. 
Um, so in regards to preparing for our activation, um, we started with a survey of like our own skills and knowledge um, and thinking about how those align with the goals of our activation. Um, so for example, Kira Armini um, is a writer and a poet, um, and they led um, the poetry aspect of our act activation. Um, Les is a painter um, and they led kind of the purposeful um, conscious like art making portion. So really making sure that our skills and knowledge are in line with like our goals. Um, and then really thinking very carefully about the work of the Life Wellness Center to ensure that our activation really honored their mission of um, providing opportunities for wellness um, to the larger community in bed -Stuy. Uh, the skills we gained in the community partnership and decolonizing thought workshops supported us in engaging with the Life Wellness Center in a transparent and equitable way, um, considering the alignment between our activation goals and their work in the bedside community. Um, additionally, we wanted to make sure that our activation was as accessible as possible by providing all materials for community members and ensuring that the skills gained could be practiced without requiring consumption um, or like a formal education. Um, we have everything we need to care for ourselves in radical and revolutionary ways. I um, really wanted our activation to highlight that, um, to emphasize that. So the way we went about that throughout our engagement, um, we invited community members to come and explore many workshops with us. Uh, so through that process, uh, we were able to engage in things like conscious art making, such as uh, painting and uh, creating a physical art piece. Uh, there was a amazing uh, self-massage workshop led by the Life Wellness Center and a also a poetry writing workshop as well. And, um, you know, some of the key takeaways from our guests during that time uh, included just the importance of spending time with our bodies, um, the ability to slow down and truly reflect on, um, you know, the different things that we may be feeling, uh, you know, throughout our day to day. And then these are just some photos from the activation. Um, so in beginning, um, we had uh, Khadija. Um, she was really gracious in um, providing all attendees with like shea butter um, and calorie shells. This idea of kind of like providing folks with like a gift um, and really thinking about that, um, like this gift giving um, as a way of connection, um, as a way of like sharing love and like fostering community. Um, and then we have photos of Les and Kira Armini just doing their thing, leading their portions of the activation. Um, so as mentioned earlier, um, we had folks um, drawing and painting um, and really using the process of using painting as a way to kind of process um, thoughts and feelings and emotions. Um, and then Kira Armini, their prompt was like really beautiful and having us kind of thinking about um, like home and the kind of this concept of home um, and writing a poem kind of based off of that. Um, so as y'all can see, we're in just a really beautiful space in Life Wellness's um, backyard. Um, and it's just really awesome kind of providing a plethora of different activities for community members to engage with um, and really creating space um, to honor ourselves, honor our bodies and honor our stories. I'm just gonna take some time. Um, just many, many thanks to Life Wellness Center for hosting our activation, um, to Khadija for facilitating a self-massage workshop, um, and just dropping so many beautiful gems throughout the entirety um, of, of her workshop. It was very much appreciated. And there's many thanks to Laundry Mat Project for their support in realizing this activation um, from financially and making sure that we were able to provide everything to our community members, um, to just physically being there, um, kind of guiding us through this process, um, and really allowing us to kind of provide this offering um, to the best side community. Um, so that's us. Thank you all so much. Thank you all so much. And now I'm bringing in Khadija from the Life Wellness Center to give a few remarks. Khadija. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Khadija Tudor. I am, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm wearing a beige sweater on this solstice day because it's cold outside as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> it's like, where is the heat? And a white shirt. Uh, I'm very excited to have been able to hold space um, for just this experience to share the work that we do in our community. Um, has been always the, the, 
the thing that we're looking to be able to do in ways that capture a different imagination of what healing could look and feel like. Um, first and foremost is always safe space um, for bodies to be able to come in and be at ease um, wherever they are. So we do a lot to let people know that wherever they are and however they arrive, they're welcome um, as their individual selves. And the stories behind just what we do here around massage and acupuncture and holistic healing is all rooted in the, the one commonality that we all need to be touched. We all need to be heard. We all need to feel safe. And this experience allowed us to show that, um, that through self-massage, you ne don't necessarily need another person to do it, that you can definitely create space for yourself and give yourself the time to take a deep breath in and reconnect with what's happening with your body. And then the connection to the art in itself, the liberating force of being able to do something, create something, express something um, from, from your inner self. Uh, I think it comes a little bit more easier when you're able to take a deep breath and find space to do that. So that's what the Life Wellness Center holds um, as its core value. And we're pretty happy to collaborate with all who are doing the same. So thank you. Thank you all so much. Now I have a question for the group and anyone who'd like to answer this. Um, understanding the power that exists within ourselves and our communities. How do we creatively leverage power for positive societal change as it relates to access to healthcare of all kinds, including the destigmatization of necessary healthcare? And to that end, what roles do self-care and self-advocacy play in this leveraging of power? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, one thing that we were thinking about is kind of living in a society in where healthcare is not accessible, healthcare is not free, um, and just like the huge barriers that we have to accessing healthcare, and really thinking about skills and what knowledge we have within our own community um, for us to highlight um, our own wellness. Um, so rather thinking about this activation and thinking about the fact that for centuries, our ancestors have had knowledge, um, whether that is like spiritual knowledge, um, um, environmental knowledge um, to heal ourselves and to care for ourselves. So just trying to create intentional space for us to kind of tap back into that um, and kind of thinking about the ways in which we have intimate knowledge of our own bodies and how can we learn to bodies and society that actively forces us to ignore the needs of our bodies, actively forces us to ignore, um, you know, the things that feel natural, things that feel right, um, even something as simple as rest, right? Sometimes like many of us might feel guilty for resting. How can create space for us to um, really unpack that feeling of guilt um, to begin to challenge that? And I feel like our activation um, was really in alignment with that. Um, and recognizing the fact that you know, healthcare is like a system and within a societal structure that is anti-Black, that is um, fat phobic, that is, um, is very ex exclusive in a lot of ways. Um, how can we hold space for ourselves um, and begin to kind of challenge those structures um, outside of like what is like formal? Um, yeah. Is there anything that anyone wants to add? Um, um, I'd like to add that the revolution of being able to have your own voice about what's happening in your body really starts with listening. And I think the slowdown is what allows you to recognize that some what, what it's supposed to look like, what it's supposed to feel like your individual body. So when you walk into spaces where you're asking for help, you can actually advocate for yourself in ways that others couldn't if they didn't know you. And the first person who's your, your healthcare advocate or your healthcare um, knower is you. I think when we start thinking of looking outside of our communities or outside of ourselves for our own care, what we do is give away our power, we give away the possibilities of leaning back into what our grandmothers and great grandmas and great grandfathers showed us to do how to heal ourselves, to drink the teas, to rub the ointment, ointments, to, you know, trust that process. And while all of the, the new things that are coming, 
we always have to remember that those new things that came are rooted in something that is old and is ancient and needs to be honored. So I think if we stay in that light, we're able to walk more into these rooms and into these spaces and demand the kind of care that looks and feels what would allow our bodies to resonate, that we would hear questions asked, not just about what happened, but why did it happen? And what are all the things that happened to make you come into the space where you said, my stomach hurts or my head hurts or my back hurts. It's a different listening when we're able to reach back and then come forward. Thank you all so much. One thing I really took away from this session as we transition into the next group, um, I just wrote down a, a few words that felt so important. The slowdown, rest, remember that we have traditions that are rooted in the ancient and the opportunity to go back to that kind of ancestral knowledge is one that lives within us. So, um, I'm definitely going to take that with me. I had the opportunity to work with uh, Trisha Hersey from who is the NAP minister uh, previously. And I've been slowly reading her newest book and there's such a wealth of information and it's such a different approach, the idea of resting and rest as resistance, and that our bodies do not necessarily need to be tied to a system that continues to want productivity out of us at the expense of our health and wellness. So thank you all so much. And I think we're ready with the next group. So the second group is the Hatties. And they worked with the Magnolia Tree Earth Center. So today I'm introducing Mahat Salim, Anna Parisi, and Mika Verendia. And uh, Mika, I believe that you're muted. While we wait for the presentation to come back up, do you all want to introduce yourselves and share what you're wearing for our ASL? Yes, I can go ahead. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Anna Parisi. I use uh, she, they pronouns. I have black short curly hair. I am wearing a black shirt. Uh, I have uh, gauges on both ears and I'm also wearing transparent um, eyeglasses. Hello, my name is Ma'a Salim. I am wearing a striped blouse and a black cardigan. Hi, I'm Mika Verandia. Uh, thanks for bearing with me. And um, I am wearing a black strapless dress or black strappy dress. Um, and I have long black wavy hair with blonde highlights. Um, she, her pronouns. And we are the Hatties. We worked with Magnolia Tree Earth Center. And um, this is our presentation. And our presentation is called Amplifying the Legacy of Hattie Carthen and Magnolia Tree Earth Center, an Urgent Call for Community. And that's us at the activation. So this project addresses issues of gentrification, historical erasure, climate education and land stewardship, through a grassroots artistic visual impact campaign, we aim to amplify the legacy of Hattie Carson, founder of Magnolia Tree Earth Center, which included posters and zines. The visual on um, the visuals featured local and original Canarse Lenape flora on posters and zines, tying Hattie's legacy back to land stewardship, 
practice of the Munsee Lenape people in an effort to understand land cultivation as well as combating gentrification and capitalism. Next slide, please. The outcome of our project included um, 200 wheat paste posters all over bed -Stuy, a suite of visual assets, which includes a zine, an oversized poster, which were put on sale. The design and the files were then donated to MTEC upon request. Our activation booth also featured plant clippings as gifts and native plants for sale, which were donated by the George Street Butterfly Garden in Ridgewood, Brooklyn. At the activation, we raised a total of $200. And actually, overall, um, MTech was able to reach their raising goal and to keep their doors open. Uh, then we distributed the zines to local bookstores, such as Mil Mundos, Loose Stockings, and the zines were also distributed to zine library archives and distros across the US, such as Barnard Zine Library, Hampshire College Amherst, Watertown Free Public Library, Booklet Library, Jacksonville Public Library, and Brown University, as well as Brown Recluse in Oakland, California. So um, we had two important uh, moments in this um, activation. Uh, we had two activations actually, right? For our first activation, uh, we had to act fast because Magnolia Tree Earth Center had a tight deadline to raise funds by Earth Day. If they didn't uh, meet the fundraising goal, they were at risk of being evicted by the city. So after actively working with them and listening, um, we designed a poster that would draw attention to their cause and to their fundraising campaign and proceeded to wheat pasting it all over bed -Stuy a week before Earth Day, which was back in April. Uh, we wanted to amplify, amplify their efforts, and uh, we picked strategic high-traffic areas in the neighborhood that would augment the fundraising campaign's visibility. Uh, once the deadline passed, it became clear that more funding was needed, right, to uh, carry out the, their interior design um, just their interior renovation. And so we took the initiative to engage local contractors, uh, specifically Brooklyn builders, and we sought the assistance from architects uh, specialized in landmark uh, building preservation. And last weekend, uh, for our second activation, um, that took place at Restoration Plaza during Juneteenth, uh, we had a booth where we sold zines and posters that we designed, as well as native plants. Um, and it was important for us to make these affordable and at a sliding scale for BIPOC peoples. Uh, and we also distributed free plant clippings to visitors that stopped by. Uh, the kids enjoyed it. Just keep an eye out for the pictures. Yeah, it gave us an, a, a real opportunity to engage uh, with community members and discuss the fundraising and to emphasize the significance of Hattie Carthen and MTEX operations. Next slide, please. We entered the project with many ideas of implementation, but after meeting with MTEX Chairman Wayne Devinish, it was clear to the board members that MTEX were very overwhelmed. We actively listened to Wayne's needs and he blatantly stated that what MTech first needed was money. So we were given a full creative range for this process and any other resources provided were welcome. We did a needs assessment and community asset mapping. We also activated and learned from community partnerships, helping local artists, Sakia Dorset, in their own efforts of speaking to MTech as well as honoring Hattie Carson's legacy and the neighborhood of Beth Stuy and understanding the importance of the organization and the domino effect of events. We amplified the narrative and told the center's story and oral history. Next slide, please. Our takeaways from working on this together or to make it as easy as possible for the organization, especially if they're crunched, and to be as generous as possible. Um, the next takeaway that we all had agreed on was that 
our group worked, it was the way that our group worked together and navigated situations. All of us have a lot of different things going on. So we all filled in and communicated, listened and met each other where the other people were. Um, someone was always holding the ball and we pushed each other out of our own comfort zones and supported each other. And the last takeaway was perseverance. When we first started this, we didn't know each other, but we achieved so much in so little time because we understood how important it was to persevere because of the domino effect of losing institutions such as MTech. So that was a motivating cornerstone of our work. Um, the further legacy for this um, project is that we're in, we continue to be in conversation with MTech and we'll engage with them as long as there is a need for what we can provide. And a few ideas we had um, for advocacy and education would be uh, a collaboration with MoMA or some sort of placement. Um, and that continues to be an iteration. So, okay, so we started actually uh, learning how to weed paste. It was very interesting. We um, shadowed uh, Sakia on their own efforts for weed pacing. Uh, weed pacing is a technique that is has long been used by activists and artists. Um, so, and it's also very quick and inexpensive uh, way of doing fly post propaganda. So we did the first night, we, we pasted um, Sikia Dorset's hero posters, just mapping out where we would like our own posters to come um, to be placed at. And then uh, a, a second night, we, we prepared the wheat paste, we put the posters out, we walked throughout bed -Stuy. It was fun. Um, next slide, please. For the design and copy of the zines, we wanted to maintain a visual and conceptual coherence uh, with the original posters that we had designed, but make sure that we were deepening um, the content, uh, providing valuable resources for the community. That spoke to uh, Hattie Carton's legacy and MTech's um, goals, visions, and mission. Uh, we also researched uh, local plants, local native plants, actually, um, bed -Stuy resources for planting and composting and created original drawings uh, to illustrate our zine. Next slide, please. Uh, what was truly rewarding was engaging with community at Restoration Plaza. We wanted to create a booth that uh, was welcoming, uh, that echoed uh, the work of Hattie Carthen in the community, while also community. explaining the work and legacy of the Magnolia Tree Earth Center. The result was a booth where young and elders engaged, asked questions, contributed, and donated. Next slide, please. Uh, I would I would like to just finish uh, and then um, just by thanking all the staff and crew and everyone that helped us out throughout these months. Uh, it has been invaluable. So thank you so much, um, Laundromat Project. And that's that. Thank you all so much. And in the spirit of the pivot that you made in your in your work, I'm actually going to pivot my question. Um, let's talk a bit. I'd love to hear from the three of you or someone individually. Um, how do you pivot? Right. This is a practical question. Um, you what I heard you say in this presentation was that you were doing very deep listening. And from those deep listening sessions, what came to light was that this organization needed financial support. And that was your pivot, that that was the most important thing. And so can you just talk us through um, anything that comes to mind when thinking of how, how you all were able to under what that process was, how you were able to come to an understanding, what the pivot looks like? I can start off with that. I'm sure my colleagues um, also have 
a lot to add to that. Um, I think we just had to do it. Um, and the our community um, partner just really needed it. And part of that was understanding the importance of an institution like MTech, really supporting them. Um, but also being realistic about what we could provide. We couldn't provide, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, but what we could provide was a strategy for amplification. We could provide um, a, vid a visual campaign. Um, and we also then had to think about the process. Um, so we're like, okay, let's prioritize the, uh, the wheat pastings. So we created the poster first and we really had to urgently um, get our, get the posters together and learn how to wheat paste luckily. Um, Sakia had already had something going on. And so we just, as Anna mentioned, piggybacked uh, off of her efforts and um, then learned it for ourselves. Um, just trying to be as conscious as possible and, and balancing that with being realistic. Uh, on my part, um, I think it was actually really funny because we really wanted to do a bunch of things. And we were like, oh, can we do this? Can we do that? Blah, blah, blah. And Wayne was like, no, I cannot. I don't have the wherewithal to do any of this right now. We need money. So it became very, like, quickly. It was like, okay, so that's it. That's what we have to do. That's, that's what they're calling for. And I think the most important thing was, uh, yes, the deep listening, but also, uh, creating um, visuals in, in an asset that later uh, continue to use uh, and continue to move forward in this journey of um, renovating these three huge, beautiful brown zones that are, are a, a, a cornerstone of this site, right? Yeah. Uh, do you want to add anything to that? Um, yes, I was also trying to be conscious of time. I would say that, like, through the deep listening practice, I was able to, um, like, listen to what Wayne needed and also through his dark humor of the fact that, um, first off, like, Magnolia needed, like, X amount of money, like, more than $100,000 to fix the, the facade of the three brownstones and then they needed another batch of money to um, renovate the interior. And also like, like listening to how like, of course, like what Anna and Mika were saying, like how, you know, crunched in time and how like desperate they needed the money, but also listening, uh, like hearing Wayne's like through his, you know, black humor, um, hearing like his resilience and also just will um, to like have us like just help him um, because, you know, we didn't know each other. We didn't really know Wayne. Wayne didn't know each other, um, didn't know us either. So it was um, very nice that, like, you know, do, through deep listening, but also um, just putting trust in us. And the Magnolia Earth um, Free Earth Center does appreciate us um, as well. Thank you all so much. What is that website one last time to donate before we transition to the next group? Um, you can go to magnoliatreeearthcenter.org and it will link to their GoFundMe page. Thank you. So that was a really wonderful understanding of, um, uh, I think maybe Micah brought it up first, meeting people where they are what it means to get out of your comfort zone. I heard words on resilience and trust and building trust. And uh, those are some really key takeaways for me. So thank you all so much. Next up, we have Food Prints working with the community partner, Deep Roots. And I'll be introducing uh, Stephen Anthony Johnson, Daquan Alexander Collier, Fei Lee, and Catherine Miranda. And we have with us Maya Marie from Deep Roots. Hi, everyone. My name is Daquan Collier. 
Alexander Collier. Um, I'm wearing currently wearing a gray blue marled shirt, and I'd like to introduce my team group, uh, Deep Roots um, Food Prints, Lord. Um, so, if you guys want to introduce yourselves quickly. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Daisy. Uh, I'm an Asian woman wearing blue um, shirt against the white background and uh, a blue shirt. Hi, I'm Stephen Anthony Johnson II. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. I'm currently wearing a pink Carhartt hat, oversized uh, black earphones, uh, gold huggy earrings, and a black uh, knitted shirt with a pink undershirt. Hello, everyone. My name is Catherine Miranda. Um, I use the he pronouns. Um, I'm currently wearing a light blue uh, knitted top um, with a dark framed glasses. I have short curly hair and I'm wearing a uh, rainbow sand jar earrings. Okay, um, and we'll go to the next slide, Chad. I also wanted to introduce our partner. Her name is Maya Marie. Um, and she is the leader of Deep Roots. I can give you her bio. She's an urban farmer and a food waste educator from Baltimore, Maryland. And she's invested in creating accessible spaces for black and brown folks to learn about food and help that center their personal stories and food traditions. Deep Roots is a culinary and ag agricultural curriculum project that uplifts black and indigenous food ways and is designed for Black Indigenous educators and learners. They aim to build a platform of re learning resources that affirm BIPOC culinary and agricultural stories. We'll go to the next slide. And let's go back. Back one. One slide back. Okay. Um, and what drew us to the project was when we first came together, we had just finished looking at the work of the Kelly Street Project um, in our workshop, and I was just really drawn in by how it was like a cookout, and I was excited, excited to see like how people were really drawn to that and how food really was um, the connective tissue of that event. So we began to talk about food and just all the things that are tied to food, how food is like a, a means of coming together and has the ability to draw people and it's connected in that way. Um, also, what we were very interested in was cap centering um, or get it, may having the ability to have intergenerational exchange in our event was also very important. And we thought food also had that ability to connect intergenerationally. Um, and also on a cultural level, food is just, um, you know, we all have our different experiences with food. I remember we talked about how all of our cultures had different forms of like an empanada. And that's how we all kind of came together and we we're talking about that and the histories that are and legacies that are tied to food. Um, but also that food is a need. We need it to live, we need it to thrive. Um, and a lot of people don't have access to food or know of a of means to access food. So in the um, spirit of walking in abundance, moving in abundance um, that we learned in um, Ebony's first lecture, we really wanted to center that and also have a space for community to come together and share these stories and have this exchange. Um, so we believe that this, the work of Deep Roots greatly aligned with the interests that we all had and that we could all lend our artistic experiences and talents to this, their Soul of Food event. Um, and the Soul of Food event um, we, was sent around Juneteenth. It was called the Juneteenth the Jubilee. Um, and Soul of Food, um, the overall series is by Deep Roots and it honors, it works to honor the connection between plants, people, and lands across Afro-Indigenous diasporas. So the lecture explored the legacy of Juneteenth and self-liberation efforts throughout the African diaspora. And Maya led a great cooking um, demonstration and a lesson centered around these histories. And we all participated in creating a communal meal together. Um, so during the activation, we asked participants to reflect on legacies and the um, of food and their food histories and channel that into art. And we'll talk more about that. Okay. Next. 
Oh, hello. Sorry, it wouldn't let me unmute myself. Um, so to pick up where the Quan left off. Um, so this goes into our activation. And so one of the things that we really wanted to make sure in our group was that we really had this um, communal collective experience associated with and about food. And it was really beautiful to see Maya offer all of these different elements um, to her community and the community of bed -Stuy. And so we really wanted to think about like, how could we deepen this experience for everyone? Um, and thinking back to the simplicity of just gathering, of eating um, together. And so we decided to take advantage of the space um, between uh, cleaning up um, after we cooked um, and preparing the food to really um, ask participants to reflect on all of their experiences that they had with all of their senses activated um, and really think about how are you connected to these foods? Like, what do these foods kind of uh, recall for you? And as you can see in these images, we handed out um, hibiscus shaped cards in honor of the red theme of the event um, and allowed participants to really reflect on, you know, their own stories and their own memories and their own histories to the foods and legacies um, that were being shared. And here we just had a few of the questions that we asked uh, participants to think about. Um, one of them being, when thinking about the meal we are sharing today, do any specific memories come to mind for you? Um, and we have an example um, on the slide of one of the cards. And these are just some of the responses that came out of that beautiful um, cultivation. And I just wanna take a second to read one of the cards because I think it's so beautiful. Um, it says, my best friend um, Leanne and I would buy one quarter of a big juicy watermelon and eat it with a soup spoons in our local mall food court after school. Um, and I think that really just kind of providing this space um, for people to think back on their own memories and histories um, really allowed them to be grounded in the moment and be grounded together um, communally and with their own histories. And so to commemorate this, we also had a hanging installation that we did um, at Phoenix Community Garden where the event um, was held and in their beautiful gazebo um, that I believe uh, has been there since 1925. Um, and as you can see here, um, we just kind of transform these cards into these lovely kind of like hanging chimes um, that would kind of live in the garden um, for the next week or so. Now I pass it on. Um, I have the privilege of documenting our activation during the soda food workshop. And there I witnessed the pure joy and active participation of community members coming together, highlighting the deeply communal nature of food. Uh, during the event, we saw Fu's role as a storyteller, each shared meal as a narrative, um, bringing live memories that travel back to our roots, traditions, and shared human experience. Through this, I realized even more deeply how Fu is a um, powerful bridge for stirring connections between people and reminding us of the sheer substance we all draw from our earth. Every bite, every shared recipe, and every conversation around the table was a moment of connection and intimacy. This is not just, a con just about consuming the meal, it's about the relationships we cultivate and the memories we form. We're deeply grateful for the opportunity Deep Roots and Laundromat Project Fellowship has provided. This journey has been about contributing and being inspired and enraged by the people, ideas, and experience we have encountered. The resources and support from Laundromat Project Fellowship has been instrumental in our growth and understanding of the intricacies of community work and artistic practice. Laundromat Project's guidance has helped us develop a strong foundation for our project. It has provided a platform for us to engage deeply with social justice issues, particularly food and culture preservation. And the connection among the fellows truly stood out in this journey. 
we have learned so much from each other's experience. And the power of this collective energy has played a significant role in shaping our work. Here, I'm not only talking about our group, but also other fellows from the whole Create Change program. We got so much uh, support and information, such as Ma'a. Uh, thank you for uh, help our group. And um, there is something profoundly healing about being part of a community actively seeking to make positive changes. And that sense of shared purpose brought an additional layer of richness to our work in Footprints. I pass on to Stephen. Uh, yeah, I mean, to to sort of wrap that up, I think that this um, experience has been a incredible foyer into stewardship, into uh, supporting and uplifting oral traditions, and also highlighting how communities are able to develop their own um, ecosystems and economies around supporting themselves. Um, yeah, I will wrap it up with that. <laughs> Thank you all so much. I have a question for your group, and um, I also would like to bring in Maya to share a few words. Uh, Maya Marie. Thanks. I just, did, I just go by Maya. Um, thank you so much. Um, my name's Maya. I am wearing uh, a yellow, kind of goldish head wrap. Um, a yellow t-shirt and gold hoops. Um, and I'm just really grateful to the Laundromat Project and the Create Change Fellows. Um, Y'all are so amazing. This is just like a really incredible um, collaboration. Um, and, uh, and this was also done in partnership with Green Thumb, um, who funds a lot of this work and even they're like this is going to be one of the most well documented <laughs> workshops we've ever done this is phenomenal um and yeah just the entire process is through a lot of the thought that y'all poured into um like co-creating this space um even from, from like doing grounding in the beginning through um you know, making sure folks are comfortable being documented through the process um, and getting to the space to help with like setting up and things like that. Um, it was just really amazing. And I, I'm just so honored that y'all were really interested in, in being a part of this event um, and, and joining in on the work that the Deep Roots does. Um, so yeah, this was just really incredibly impactful and I, I, I the participants really enjoyed it as well. You could really see um, even just as I've been going over and looking at some of the, the reflective um, flower art pieces that were, were created during the time and um, just really special. It just made the, the space even more special than I um, originally had envisioned, just like 10 times more amazing. So really appreciate y'all. Um, and I'm really grateful for all this work that that you know we're doing um even outside of outside of this collaboration and yeah i just hope that we can continue to collaborate um you know possibly in the future um and all of that so thanks so much thank you maya that was so generous i have one final question for the group and it's really kind of tying back to all the things we've heard in your presentation and that's food is memory connectivity sustenance and crucial to our existence uh, what role does food play in making meaning, shifting narratives, and creating change in the world? Or ro what role can it play? And then my second question is, what did you serve to eat? Because that plate looked delicious. <laughs> um, I'll answer the first question. Um, I'm constantly uh, reminded of this quote from um, Lei Shandao, who is the founder of Permacultural Ways, who does permaculture education in India for farmers in low, so, uh, low socioeconomic places. Um, she says that no community, when given agency over their food and their food ecosystems, um, develops uh, the means that support them in piecemeal. Everything is done holistically um, from the curation and the space 
and um, the nutritional value of everything that is cons consumed by the community has the community in mind, first and foremost, and the, the uh, ability for it to exist in perpetuity. Um, so in a lot of ways, food in and, in and of itself is a living archive, is a living memory um, and information that allows people to subsist long, long after the stewards who um, who have originated, have cultivated, have tended to, and have stewarded the land have gone on. And you see that from big ways, from ancestral farming practices. Um, my grandmother uh, is part, was part indigenous and kept a, uh, a bean garden and a watermelon garden in her, um, in her backyard to the day that she died. Um, and also to uh, passing down uh, recipes and preparation practices are all living memories that contain stories, um, contain anecdotes, um, everything up to parables. And those are means in, in which in a very sort of like low tech way that we continue on carrying identity and personhood and selfhood throughout the food that we eat. So as, as a method of change forward. I honestly think it's a it's more of a means of sustaining. If you can keep the culture, if you can keep the food, if you can keep the recipes, if you can keep the the means of stewardship, the community will survive regardless through famine, regardless through displacement, um, through what whatever means or way or mile or whatever have you. People will keep the <laughs> the traditions of the food that they eat wherever that they go because they keep it in their heart, they keep it in their stomachs. And that second, that second question, it was chicken, corn, uh, succotash, uh, corn and tomato succotash, and uh, watermelon and lemon uh, lemonade. And it was bussin. Watermelon <laughs> lemonade. That was a huge Watermelon <laughs> Sounds delicious. Thank you all so much. So I, what I kind of took away from that group, one of the many things, uh, food is archival. And I kind of got chills and paraphrasing the, um, the last comments that living memories, food is living memories. And if you keep the food, then you can keep the culture. And um, I, I just want to pause on that. If you can keep the food, you can keep the culture. And so we are heading into the panel with creative restoration. And I think we're all set to go. So I am going to call in the participants of creative restoration who are mapping community practices and resources in bed -Stuy. And it is Hannah Miao, Claudia Maturell, Gloria Lau, and Marwa Elta here. And we have Robin Murphy, who is our community partner from Restoration Billy Holiday Theater. Um, hi everyone, my name is Gloria, my pronouns is she, her. Um, I have black short hair, I'm wearing a black top with white dots uh, pattern. I'm gonna let my group introduce themselves first. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Claudia Maturell, she, her pronouns, and I am wearing a light pink long sleeve shirt and a knitted gray uh, cardigan. Hi everyone, my name is Marwa El Tahir, my pronouns are she, her. I'm currently wearing a red sweatshirt and a beige hat with the word powerful on it. Hi, my name is Hannah. My pronouns are she, her. I'm wearing a black t-shirt. Um, thank you. Okay, um, can you go to the next slide? Okay, so we're the Creative Restoration Group. Uh, next slide. Um, so when our group came together, we discussed a lot about um, access to resources are not equally distributed um, among communities. So for this fellowship, we decided to focus on creative resources. Um, mainly, we believe that creativity allows communities to express themselves and also let us collectively 
dream and imagine what uh, our future could be together. Um, for our partnership, we uh, work with Restoration Plaza and we are working with them to survey community members about their creative practices and then uh, their resources needs in bed style. Um, and we will be sharing the results with them to inform them on their future arts programming. And I'm gonna let Mawa talk about a little bit about our process. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Gloria. Um, yeah, it was it was really important for us to first kind of, um, you know, do a sort of mapping among ourselves and our group to see where our different um, talents and strategies overlap and intersect. And for us, there was a really big um, interest just around public space. How is public space used um, for creative, specifically in by Brooklyn? Um, and how can we contribute to, to the growing and the evolution of that with the neighborhood? Um, so we decided to um, partner with Restoration Plaza. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar, Restoration Plaza is a really big public and like meeting social space in Bedside, Brooklyn, located um, along Fulton Street, along Fulton and Marcy. Um, and it's really, really a, a historic space for a lot of um, Bedside community members. Um, of course, the Billy to Holiday Theater is a really big um, performance space that has brought in so many artists in the community. And yeah, it's named after, of course, one of our wonderful Black ancestors that died his work, Billy Holiday, um, and so many other amazing activists have shown up in that space, such as Shirley Chisholm and, and other folks to really activate and mobilize. So we decided to hold our activation there and partner with the folks there. We um, had two activations first on May 25th, which was for um, one of the song salons that the Billy Holiday Theater um, was holding that month. And so we got to me and partner with Robin Murphy, um, the interim director of the Billy Holiday Theater, um, and really, um, yeah, ask her kind of like what she needs um, and what she thinks that community members will um, need. So we decided to focus on two main questions that we were going to survey community members coming into the space. Um, the first being, how do you already incorporate creativity in your life? Um, we really wanted to just like capitalize off of um, the information that the community members already had to offer. Um, and then we wanted to ask them what resources um, would help you to live a more creative life. Um, so we had billboards and invited folks to write in their answers, draw in their answers, express their answers. Um, and then we repeated that activation again on June 17th for CalCAP's um, annual Juneteenth celebration, also at Restoration Plaza. Um, really in both these uh, parts of these activations, um, we utilize the skills and tools that we learn in the Building Community Partnership Workshop here at the LP. Um, and really a big takeaway from that is we are not alone. Um, we can all really like, uh, you know, use each other in this community to, to grow the resources that we already have and to ask, you know, for the resources that we don't have and that we need. Um, Restoration Plaza is going through a really big renovation in the next couple of years. Um, and so we really wanted to be able to have a place to survey, collect this data, and then turn this data into a visual, visual representation, um, which we're going to do, you know, through the process of creating a zine that can then live at Restoration Plaza and inform future um, decision making there for public programming and how the public space is going to be used um, really well keeping creative in mind. Um, yeah, two really big skills that we utilize for this is really just um, centering trust and listening deeply to what community members have to tell us and just, you know, from there synthesizing that information, such as learning that, you know, legacy is super important in Medsci, how can we create, create resources for an, for an older aging population, how can we make that accessible? Um, so yeah, I'll pause there and pass it on. Thanks, Marwa. I will talk a little bit about some of the found findings we had through our conversations with participants. Um, so the responses and conversations with participants highlighted the richness of the creative practices among bed community members, um, especially those who might not consider themselves artists or express themselves in ways 
that fall outside of what is considered a formal art form. Um, it also really illuminated the needs and desires among community members to incorporate more creativity into their lives. Um, common artistic practices included dancing, drawing, writing, music. Participants highlighted crafts like knitting, games like double dutch, and everyday domestic activities like gardening and cooking also sparked creativity for community members. Um, the biggest resource that would help community members unlock more creativity is, of course, money. Um, participants expressed the need for grants, sponsorship, funding for creative projects, as well as affordable housing um, and healthcare in general. Uh, community members also sought free and accessible spaces to make art and free workshops for learning creative practices and other skills like building resumes and portfolios. Additionally, they expressed interest in connecting with other creatives and building an artistic network, um, as well as a desire for a really safe, non-judgmental environment to explore their creativity. And I'll pass it on to Claudia. Hello. Um, so we had a, for the second um, activation, which was the the actual final activation at the Restoration Plaza Juneteenth event, we added the component of uh, portraits and photography. And a lot of people really respond really well to that. And you can see by these faces that, you know, they were really showing up and showing out. And um, uh, we wanted to capture this because as, as we're creating this final zine that we're putting together, we wanted to showcase the beautiful faces of bed and the joy and the Black joy in, the, in our community. And um, we thought this would be a great visual to to capture to capture that um, one second. And here are some more images um, that showcase, uh, you know, just some happy faces, some of our fellows who were also um, having their activation with us and just like the kind of liveliness and spirit of our, of our community. We just, we had a blast that day and, and we love to, to see everyone come out. Um, and I think that's, that's kind of a wrap for us. Is there anything else that the group um, wanted to share or that we were in touch on? Great, thank you all so much. I have a few questions. Um, I think it'd be really interesting for us to hear what were some of the tools you used to build trust with the people you engaged for feedback and visioning during the Juneteenth celebration? And then the second part of that question is, how closely will you be able to continue to work to help facilitate some of that visioning? I can speak to the first question. Um, first, off, right off the bat, it was really important for us to partner with a very well-established community organization such as Restor Restoration Plaza and also staging the activation at a long-running event like the Juneteenth Celebration um, helped facilitate some of that. Um, we wanted to make our table feel warm and inviting using colors and offering fruit. Um, we felt it was important to provide snacks as well as the free portraits as an offering to thank participants for their time and to invite them into um, conversation. Um, and we started the dialogue with conversation and questions and really didn't push anyone who didn't want to speak with us, but we found that community members were very eager to engage in conversation and speak about how they are creative in their lives. Um, and so uh, we're really hopeful that the findings can help Restoration Plaza continue programming for the community. Yeah, and I can tackle the second part of that question. Um, and I'll add to, to what Hannah just said in terms of, I think you saw in some of the photos, there were like, you know, we had people double dutching in front of like, you know, um, kind of like where we were having conversations. And then there were all these sort of like side conversations happening with the portraits. And it was just very um, alive. And so I feel like in that way, um, you know, there was a trust because you, you showed up vulnerable and both met us in that way too. So that was really beautiful to see. Um, and just, yeah, in, in continuing the vision that we have, we're really excited to put together the zine and um, officially share it with Restoration Plaza. So for us, I feel like, um, you know, having um, community mapping in that way is a really rich resource um, that can help inform future programming. Um, and that we, you know, we have developed now this wonderful relationship with um, Robin, who couldn't be here with us today. Um, but, you know, just continuing to, 
to build on that relationship. Um, and I'm excited to, you know, for all of us to go to future events at Restoration Plaza and um, yeah, continue to just be involved in that process. Great, thank you all so much. And we've come to the end of tonight's program. I would like to give a massive congratulations to Community Well, the Hatties, Food Prints, and Creative Restoration, and all community partners for your generous projects, thoughtful reflections, and engaging dialogue. A special thank you to the incredible team at the Laundromat Project for the invitation to host tonight's program. And thank you to the audience for joining us. Hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Good night.